Welcome to the AI Show, Auckland's monthly AI event. This presentation features Julian Seidenberg, the head of artificial intelligence at Datch. Julian showcases the technical complexity they face developing generative AI for frontline workers in industrial jobs. Of note was the ability to switch large language models to overcome language barriers in challenging environments. Hello everyone, I'm Julian Seidenberg. I'm the head of AI of two different software companies. Yeah, I know I'm crazy. Um, Dutch and Narrative. Narrative is a mix software for professional photographers to speed up their workflow, photo selection and photo retouching, photo editing, not photo retouching. Uh, so color correction and so on. I can tell you all about that, but that's for another day. Today, I'm talking to you about lessons learned at Datch, which is a company that helps frontline workers in heavy industry streamline their record keeping and process following. Completely different to narrative, of course, but equally interesting. So lessons learned on Datch. Datch is a company uh, across Auckland, Christchurch, San Francisco, and New York, who works with the likes of Contact Energy or TechNX, who are a big manufacturing company around the world, to speed up their record keeping and uh, improve their checklist, like I said. The basic problem is that normally, when if you're a worker doing work in an industrial job, you either have a horrible paper checklist that you have to go through and you have to check, out, check things off, write things down, and then someone has to decipher that handwriting and it doesn't work, or you have SAP as a system and you have to navigate SAP, which is the worst design software ever created by humanity, and um, try, and it takes half an hour just to enter your time sheet. And it's incredibly frustrating and everyone hates it, but it's necessary because for all the accounting and all of the enterprise planning that you need to do as a, as a large manufacturing company or utility, it's the only thing, well, maybe IBM, IBM Maximo can also do it, but there are very few software that are flexible enough to meet an enter, a large enterprise's needs. So, oh, yes. Yeah, Salesforce. Not many uh, legacy manufacturing companies use Salesforce, although probably more should. Indeed, <laughs> yes. It's, it's probably nicer than SAP, for sure. <laughs> Good point. Um, solution that Dutch offers is instead of having to interact with those systems, you talk to your phone and problem solved. So the Dutch app, a worker pulls this up and they talk to their phone they go through the checklist, the phone speaks to them saying, do this, and they go, yes, I've done this, and this was the outcome. And it synchronizes that into SAP so that the accountants are happy, the planners are happy, they have high quality information, but the workers are also happy because they don't have to use software that they don't understand. They have a specifically tailored workflow that's individualized to them and their job. And uh, they can take notes, they can report, report false, report near misses, report all, everything they need to do as part of their job, they can report this by talking to their phone. They can also type to their phone if they want to, but talking is very valuable, especially in an industrial job where someone needs their hands to do work. An electrician climbing up a pole, you can't get their phone out, and let go of the pole, right? It's not gonna work. So you need, need to be able to talk to your phone through your head, Bluetooth headset, potentially, and that offers that solution. So today I'm going to talk about three challenges we had when designing this system and how we overcame various sub aspects of these challenges. And hopefully it'll be educational for everyone and uh, learnings that you can take to your business. One, of, one was about speech to text, the next about natural language understanding, and then three, truthful question answering. All right. Okay, first one, challenges with text, speech to text. First of all, accuracy. Who uses Siri and hates it? <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Speech to text is hard. It's been an incredible challenge to understand people's varied voices. People speak in different accents. People uh, have different inflection, how they speak. It's very hard to do. We need to accurately understand speech from workers in industry who might come, a, come from a migrant background. They don't speak the native language of the country they're in, in with a perfect accent. So it's very difficult. Next, technical jargon. People use all kinds of technical jargon in, in industry. We have to be able to understand that and correctly transcribe it. Next, yeah, immigrant workers, I already talked about that. Foreign languages. 
immigrant workers often will revert to their native language when explaining something if they don't have the words for it in, in say, English. In the USA, where we do a lot of business, lots of workers from, from Mexico speaking Spanish, switching Spanish between Spanish and English, English mid-sentence when trying to explain something. Incredible challenge. Um, next, we need to be as close to real time as possible. You can't say something and then wait 10 seconds for it to appear on the screen. It's frustrating. No, no one would use it. And we really would like to work on offline speech transcription. We work with some mining companies. And if you're down in the mine, there is no phone reception. So it's very hard to, you, the app still needs to be functional, even if you don't have, uh, don't have internet access. And even customers that are not in the mine, you're working in a, in a factory that's lots of steel, lots of metal, it blocks cell phone reception. So how we addressed all of these things? First of all, for accuracy and foreign language transcription, transformer-based models such as uh, Whisper from OpenAI are really good at this. Mm, I have no idea why Apple can't be better at this than <laughs> in Siri, but our speech to text is remarkably good at understanding foreign languages, understanding that someone switching languages mid-sentence, no problem. Uh, and part of the reason why this is, is this chart here on the, is this a laser pointer? No. Um, no. This chart on the right, where you look at the size of uh, large language models. And you're you thinking this is talk about generative AI. Uh, why am I talking about speech to text? Speech to text is now generative AI. Because in, in addition to translating what the sound waves are to text, speech to text is translating the sound waves to text and then guessing based on what, it, what the next likely word would be, what the next likely word should be, even if the person didn't say that. We had a use case in an airline where the workers were saying, sit cover, sit cover, stop working, sit cover at their phone. And what they were meaning was seat cover, but it actually sounded like sit cover. So, um, and GPT-4 could understand that in context, but GPT-4 is gigantic and really slow to run. Um, therefore, we no possible way we can run it, run it offline on the phone. But something like the transformer-based speech-to-text model that we are using is just a little bit too big to fit on a phone, but small enough that it can run fast and get some of this nuance, get a little bit of this nuance. So to the second one, jargon and accents, we can understand jargon and accents by prompting the model, similarly to how you would prompt a large language model by saying, I'm a worker in a mine doing this kind of work, and then, or I'm a worker in an airline cleaning the seats, and when, when the, the speech transcription models here is sit cover, it actually writes seat cover because it understands the context, similar to GPT-4. Real time, you can, get, you can do a lot of work to crack open one of these models and make it streaming. So we did that, and we can get real time transcription. And offline, uh, we're not there yet. Phones are not yet fast enough, but maybe wait two or three years, and GPUs on phones will be able to run two billion parameter size models natively. So we will be able to do this soon. Next. Natural language understanding. We need to understand what the user meant when they said something. Transcribing it is not enough. We need to know what does that mean? What do we need to do in response to this? Uh, so we need to understand their intent. We need, and we need to do this fast. We can't just, if we use base GPT for this, the response, the, the latency of going, of transcribing what the user said, going up to the GPT server, coming back down to our response and answering, on the phone, that can be a, like a second, maybe a second or two. That's too long if you're navigating an interface. You're going, open this form, no wrong form, go back. You want that to be snappy. You want that, our, our users get frustrated if we, are, we have a second delay between every action. It feels clunky, it feels old. Uh, we want to blow them away. So we need to be fast. Uh, we also need to, occasionally, the user breaks from simple commands into a long monologue where they say, well, this was wrong, this was wrong, I did this, and they go on and on. You need to be able to understand that. And they self-correct themselves. There was a problem in seat five. Oh no, actually it was seat three. We need to be able to understand that. 
And finally, transcription errors. As good as the speech to text is, sometimes it gets it wrong. So we want to adapt to all those things. And here is one of our forms that was filled out uh, by a user on the right. So how we handle these things? Uh, believe it or not, <laughs> traditional NLP uh, seems to be dead with the advent of GPT. But for a use case like this, no, it's not. So we can leverage all of the great work that has been done in traditional NLP before GPT came onto the market. And the, the real amazing benefit, we can run it offline, we can run it on the phone easily, <laughs> trivially on the phone. We can, um, and it's really, really fast. Millisecond response time, like 10 milliseconds to come back with a response. Really fast. So users love it because they can say, open form three, and form three is already open. <laughs> they haven't even finished speaking. So um, really great for that. And they're, they're not, it's not trying to interpret some complex um, business report or something, annual, annual statement like you were saying. No, it's, um, it's simple commands. Open this, close this, next field, previous field. It's easy enough to do with traditional technology. But when they break into monologue, we switch from that to use GPT-4, of course, to understand what they, what they were saying, what they were meaning when they, when they break into the monologue and take the form here. So someone can say, there was a leak in the turbine hall in the inlet valve one, it was leaking, I'm requesting a fix, it'll be a problem if it's unresolved, and you get the form filled out for you. Which is, of course, so much better than what workers are used to. This, this skips several generations of improvement. And finally, transcription errors. When we know what the likely things are that the user might select, we have a list of assets that we are mapping against, or we have uh, a list of commands that we expect in a certain situation, we can phonetically match what they're saying or just use GPT-4. But if we want to be fast, we're running offline, we can phonetically match, oh, this sounded kind of like this other thing. So let's match the thing that it sounded like, not what they actually said. And finally, truthful question answering. This is all the rage in every company. What you have to account for hallucinations. You don't want GPT to be making up stuff in an industrial set setting especially. Like, should I cut the red wire or the blue wire? And GPT goes, well, James Bond cut the red wire. <laughs> so, so you should go ahead. No, we, it needs to be truthful. We can't hallucinate. Um, we, need, we want to access internal documents and databases, of course. Synchronize with SAP and document management systems to be able to truthfully answer based on what is relevant in the company's documentation. Of course, we want to be secure. Some of this, uh, some of this proprietary knowledge is extremely important to the company to keep private. It's, uh, yeah, you can imagine all of the, uh, the company secrets there in these systems. And there are sometimes complex questions that require multi-step reasoning to answer. It's not, not so simple as look something up and be able to answer. You need to go through like five steps of thinking to get to an answer. How we did this. Uh, of course, retrieval augmented generation, which is older, older rage, rag, is the way to overcome, um, overcome this access to internal documents and, and databases. We, we take the question, turn it into a series of numbers that represent the meaning of the question, search for those numbers, search for articles that carry the same meaning as those numbers uh, in, in the database of all documents, get those documents, add them to the GPT-4 along with the question so it has the context of those documents, and GPT-4 answers your question in the context of the documents it's been, it's been given from the vector search. That tends to mostly provide a truthful answer, one other trick we found is to reduce hallucinations. If you ask, if you tell GPT, if you don't know the answer, say, sorry, I don't know. It will say, sorry, I don't know, if it doesn't know the answer. If you don't tell it that, it will try to please and give you some answer, even if it doesn't know. And the phrase, sorry, I don't know, is specific. That's, I heard this, I think, from a lecture of someone at OpenAI. Sorry is a very... Sorry is not really used in documents around, if you're writing a, 
a document somewhere for uh, a mining company. You're not going to write sorry in your, in your manual. So it's very good because it's a, a token. It's a word that GPT can jump to very reliably when it doesn't know something, rather than thinking, should I say this? Should I say like mining robot or drilling machine? It, it's not going to think sorry. So sorry is a great thing to jump to when it, when it indeed doesn't know. It can't confuse it with another word. Um, data security and privacy, Azure, yes. <laughs> Companies are a lot more comfortable with Azure controlling, Microsoft controlling their data than uh, OpenAI controlling their data, even though they are funded by each other and they make equal security guarantees with each other. Uh, Azure just gives them a lot more confidence that their OpenAI won't steal their data and use it for some, <laughs> some crazy idea. So uh, routing the GPT queries into, through Azure, through a, a private, virtual private network, is, um, gives companies a lot of confidence. And there's so much hype around GPT-4 and generative AI in general that as soon as you say, oh, yeah, we're going through Azure, they're like, what? Security approved. <laughs> so security is not as much of a problem as I thought it might actually be. Of course, we, we are SAT2 certified, or at least on the journey, and going through all those things too. So we need to be secure. But in terms of the LLM of the, uh, the GPT, Azure seems to tick the box, and people are happy. And finally. Complex questions that require multi-step reasoning to answer. Uh, we are currently working on this. I was working on this today. It's, it's a complicated problem. Uh, there is several different approaches you can take. For example, you can, you can break the problem into a, a lang chain multi-step problem. You can, you can invoke a mixture of experts. You can have multiple different large language models try to answer the question and then combine them. There's many, many different approaches, some of which work, some of which don't work, depends on the use case. Um, watch, watch this space, I would say. <laughs> All right, so summary of overall learnings that we had when trying to build this assistant for frontline workers in industry. Speech-based apps are fully viable if you use one of the transformer-based speech transcription models. Uh, don't think just because Siri doesn't understand you, speech to text is not possible. Speech to text now, if you use something like Whisper, it is completely viable and it understands you 99% of the time perfectly. GPT alone is not enough. People think, oh yeah, I'll just slap GPT onto, onto my problem and problem solved. <clears throat> no, as you can see from, from this talk, there are so many little things that you need to consider that, and add together to create a good user experience for the user. Sometimes the speed of response is really important. Sometimes you don't want to respond with GPT. Sometimes you, the, the speech aspect and configuring that is really important. There's so many things you need to consider that GPT alone, just blinders thinking, generative AI is all the hype, let's do generative AI. That's not going to add, adequately solve a business problem. We need to think more broadly than just applying generative AI in isolation. Uh, hallucinations. When ChatGPT first came out, this was a big problem. GPT itself is getting better at this. And with re retrieval augmented generation, it's, we're hardly seeing any hallucinations anymore. So it's, it was a problem. It's much less of a problem than it was even six months ago. And finally, owning and this is the Apple. Uh, Apple is very big on this where you want you to own and control the core technologies of the user's journey. Uh, we can't own something like GPT. We can't own something like Whisper, which is a, a, the speech transcription model. They're too big for a small New Zealand and American company to, to build one of these, but we can own everything else in the journey. So we want to own and control as much of that so that we can optimize and provide the best value for our users and protect us from disruption, of course. So. Uh, thank you very much.